Welcome, everybody, to the Kona Shane Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I am here with the one and only Dr. Mac, a cardiologist at Purdue, is back, and we are talking about the coughing cat. This is a great episode for working up these cases. Uh, it's interesting what percentage of these are cardiac cases and what percentage is not. And how do you separate them and how do you know? And so we go through that. This is quick and to the point. It's a great episode. I took a ton of notes on this. Oh, man, I just love having Dr. Mac here. Guys, you're in for a treat. Let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Anna McManamay. Thanks for being here, Dr. Mac. Hi, it's nice to be here. Oh man, I love having you in the podcast. You're 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 so great. <laughs> um, so yeah. Fun. I was well. I was just thinking about. I was just thinking about recently. Uh, you know, when you and I met, and we just. I just happened to sit next to you at a table at the VMX co- uh, conference a year ago, and we started talking. And I was like, "This person is super fun." And so <laughs> you've been on the podcast, I think, at least four times now. Uh, I think so, yeah. And yeah. so anyway, maybe six. I don't know. You're out there. I you, but you're you. I just gosh, I enjoy my time with you. I got I got something super fun for you today. I want to talk to you about coughing cats. And when I was in vet school, I distinctly remember being taught like coughing cats are an emergency and they're a, they're a cardiac emergency. And so I I just wanted to stop and run through that. I have had some stressful situations in my career where the coughing cat or the heavily breathing like gasping cat comes in and um and I've had these patients die and and it is it is awful and it's scary and it's stressful. I just want to talk through that with you. Um talk to me about the coughing cat, if you don't mind, and kind of how do you look at these cases and, and what should general practitioners know? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think there are, there are kind of like two schools. I've had people that say, well, I was taught cats cough with CHF in school. And then I have the others who are like, pretty sure they said they don't cough with CHF. So it's still, I think cats in general are so challenging, um, even for cardiologists. So I would say that anecdotally, so I'm still a young cardiologist and I've been a doctor since 2016, but only a cardiologist for like a year and a half. But um, anecdotally, it's very uncommon for cats with pulmonary edema from heart disease present with cough. Um, It's unlike dogs. And I don't think we still know. We all kind of give this just like, it sounds good answer of, oh, their cough receptors are different. But it is interesting to me that cats with pulmonary edema secondary to cardiac disease, they don't tend to cough. I mean, they might have like a <coughs> cough, but it's not like a dog or uh, with mitral valve disease or with DCM. So it's interesting. I would say the ones that I have seen cough because of congestive heart failure have had severe pleural effusion or severe pericardial effusion. So I don't think it's fair to say that they never cough with CHF, but I do think it's uncommon to be cardiogenic pulmonary edema as the cause. So If I have a referral for a coughing cat, we kind of not, we don't roll our eyes or like, oh, it it may not be even heart disease. The animal may have concurrent heart disease, but we may have more work than just saying, oh yes, this is congestive heart failure or not. Okay. So typically when I have a coughing cat, um, ideally the most important test is going to be thoracic radiographs. That's the most important thing. And I think you bring up a really good point that some of these animals are very fragile by the time they get to you. And yeah. you know, we have that saying, no animal should die in radiology. And I think that's very true. So things that you can try to do, my fam- I'm in favor of doing a dorsal ventral view. It yeah. might not be great. Just don't get a hand in there, but like, just do something that gives you a quick snapshot. Does this animal have severe pleural effusion? Does this animal have severe edema? Or is there no edema and this is an asthmatic cat? You know, with yeah. hyper- and bronchial cuffing. So I think at least that view gives you something to work with. Um, I think treatment wise, oxygen is never a bad idea unless the animal's on fire. So yeah, exactly. when I'm on oxygen, um, I think sedative wise, butorphanol is my favorite um, because it is probably one of the safest cardiovascular drugs we have. Um, and it is a cough suppressant. So kind of two birds, one stone with that. Okay. Um, I'll use doses anywhere from 0.2 mg per kg all the way up to 0.5 mg per kg um, IV or IM for butorphanol and kitty cats. Um, but I think that ultimately the thoracic radiographs are going to 
give you the most important information in that nitty gritty time frame. Um, then I think if you have it, point of care ultrasound. So those little sonocytes that you can use to do cystocentesis on. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to just look. Is there severe pleural effusion? I can tap that and stabilize this animal. Yes or no. I think that can be very helpful. Um, once you get skilled enough, you can actually start to look at chamber sizes of the heart, like the left atrium in particular. But I think that that's a little bit more um, specialized of a skill set. And so yeah, not going to be that's available. Be, that's beyond, I'll be honest, that's beyond me. Like I can, I can see the heart. I can see it beating. I have not, I have not crossed that threshold of being able to measure. <laughs> I'm like, yep, there it is. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, fluid, fluid, no fluids. Really all you got to know. Yeah. All right, good. All right. Now, see, that's, that's what I need. I just validation. I feel good. But when it comes to trying to decide, does this animal have heart disease. Does the animal have a thing I need to do further investigation for or start treatment for congestive heart failure? I would say the nice thing about congestive heart failure is that it's very treatable and it should respond very quickly to medications. So unlike, I always pick on pneumonia, but unlike pneumonia where there can be a radiographic lag between when the pulmonary pattern shows up and when it resolves, congestive heart failure, it's like it's there or it's not there. And then once you start giving a diuretic, it really should start working within an hour of giving that. So it's it's something that's kind of easy to rule out if they fail therapeutic trial for that, yeah. for that um, disease process. That's the nice thing about it. Um, I think cats in general with heart disease, it's everybody's nemesis. Um, they can be so tricky. They don't have to have a heart murmur. I think having the presence of a murmur, the presence of a gallop sound, so it's like that third heart sound that kind of sounds like a horse literally galloping yeah. um, or the presence of an arrhythmia. Those things would increase my index of suspicion that there is truly heart disease. But there are so many other reasons for cats to get those. So it's, it's not the most sensitive, but at least lets you go down that pathway. So right. if I have any of those findings on my physical exam, then what I do is I do things like a I know it sounds kind of off the wall, but a T4. So including in my blood work, check their thyroid level. Because if I think this cat has heart disease, I need to rule out hyperthyroidism and I need to rule out systemic hypertension. So T4, blood pressure, those are going to be on my list if I'm going down the cardiac pathway. Okay. The other test I think could be helpful is the BNP test. So this is the biomarker. Um, I think I talked a little bit about it in one of the podcasts re uh, previously, I should say, mm -hmm. but this is a biomarker that basically assesses for heart stretch. So it's like the heart's own diuretic, if you will. Um, it's a natriuretic peptide. So it's released by the ventricles when they feel stretched. And it goes to the kidney and tells the kidney to urinate sodium. And then therefore water follows. So this tells you if the heart feels any type of duress. It doesn't tell you why it does. It just tells you that it's got some sort of disease going on. So there is a send out test and there's a snap test. And you can kind of use the, the grade or severity of that number to help you say, is it likely CHF, I should treat this, or unlikely CHF, I need to go down a different pathway. Um, and so I think, I think it's still the most prudent to rule out congestive heart failure, because again, it's the easiest thing to treat, fastest thing to treat, probably most life-threatening. And then once you've done that, then you can feel a bit more comfortable about doing things like treating for, you know, airway disease, chronic inflammatory airway disease, asthma, bronchitis, um, those kinds of things, which will need like beta agonists, like albuterol or steroids, which is always a little bit scary to do with cats that could have Yeah, always. So. Hey guys, I just want to jump in here with a quick update. Uh, have you seen the Dr. Andy Rourke team training courses yet? Guys, over at DrAndyRourke.com, I have got resources for people who want to work with their team. I have my Angry Client course, and I have my Exam Room Toolbox course. These are great little modules that are made to be broken up and popped into staff meetings so that you can cover a quick topic about either dealing with angry clients, complaining clients, or uh, or to talk about different tools in uh, working with clients in the in the exam room. Guys, this is fantastic. I've got discussion questions to ask your team so they can talk about what they do and just is a great way for everybody to see the, the same thing together to talk about what works in the practice and what uh, and, and what they think is important and just to get on the same page. Anyway, I hope you guys will check it out. It's over at drandywork.com. I'll put a link in the show notes. Let's get back into this episode. Talk to me a little bit more about the interaction with hyperthyroidism and cardiac disease. Are you okay to break that down a little bit? Sure, absolutely. So 
I kind of teach it as there are three hypers whenever you see a thick left ventricle. So you okay. could have primary hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So HCM, which technically is idiopathic. So there's just this innate thickening of the muscle and rearrangement of the fibers. There's no underlying other disease. But you could also have something we call an HCM phenotype. So it's thickening of the left ventricle, but it's because of systemic hypertension or hyperthyroidism, which is pretty common in our older cat populations. So I could talk probably an hour about how the thyroid hormone affects the heart, but the nitty gritty is that ultimately it puts the body in an upregulated metabolic demand. So we have hypertrophy of the heart muscle, even if there's no systemic hypertension, this still will happen. And they get fibrosis of those cells. The thyroid hormone acts inside the nucleus, so it affects the DNA of those heart cells. So it's long lasting change. Um, and so these animals can get these thick ventricles, these dilated hearts, big left atrium, and still have congestive heart failure just because of hyperthyroidism. Um, and so the nice thing with it is it's reversible in a lot of cases. So one of my favorite stories is a cat named Sylvester who had was 18 years old. He had never been to a vet ever. <laughs> and mm -hmm. he showed up in my residency dying. Um, he went on the ventilator and his thyroid was 13.4 T4. And we were like, this isn't good. You've never been to a vet. Like, are you okay to manage heart failure ventilation and methimazole therapy? And she did it. And that cat lived for three more years, it came off all of its heart meds, ended up dying of like a gastric carcinoma. But um, I think, <laughs> so I mean, like something's got to get them. But I think that it just reemphasizes the importance of looking for those underlying comorbidities that could be reversible and lead to a really more positive prognosis. Yeah, that's amazing. Cool, cool. All right, wonderful. That 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 totally makes sense. Um, I, I'll, I'll, it all it checks all the boxes for me. Is there anything else, any other uh, pearls uh, that you can think of to be looking for in these patients? Anything that, that tends to get missed when things get referred to you? Yeah, I think that um, for, for coughing animals that get referred, I think one of the biggest probably pitfalls is that there's just not the time for that clinician to really get a good history on these patients. I think we're all so busy and Unlike academia, where I've got, you know, hours to talk to clients in my day, um, you guys have to do these cases in like 15 minutes. And so I think what I started doing was to have a history form that my clients filled out. So they filled it out at the time of the appointment or in the waiting room, whatever it is. And that just really helped me because I think help having the knowledge of how often is this animal coughing? When is it coughing? Is it self-limiting? Is there something that always incites this coughing? What's the character of the cough? Do they have a video recording of the cough? Whatever that is, it really helps narrow down your differential list. And so if you don't have the ability to run all of the tests, you can focus your energy on the things that are more likely. So I think the thing that gets overlooked the most is just really getting a good history and asking questions, sometimes repeating them. Because <laughs> like, I feel like as a student, we always ask, is your dog vomiting? You're like, no. And then the doctor would go in and they'd be like, oh yeah, five times a day, vomiting yeah, all the time. Exactly. So I think it helps to just really hone in on that history question. Um, and I think that's something that gets missed quite a bit just because of time. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Um, are there any any resources that you really like? Any, uh, yeah, any tools in the toolbox that you were like, oh man, I wish more people knew about this? Yeah, I think um, for cats in particular, it's, um, it's a little nerdy, but the, the ACVIM consensus statements, so this is the American College of uh, Veterinary Internal Medicine, they publish these um, kind of big old articles, uh, usually like once every five years on a certain topic. And so these, you can Google it, ACVIM consensus statement. You don't need special memberships to read these. And it's basically a bunch of specialists, just opinions slash what is proven slash what they would do with all of these in like kind of situations. And so they have one for feline cardiomyopathy. They have one for mitral valve disease, systemic hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, hyperthyroid. They have them for everything wow. almost. So I think those are really helpful and they also are filled with references at the bottom. So if you want to learn more, you can always go there next. That's fantastic. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. I always appreciate uh, having you. Where can people find you if they uh, if they want to reach out? Yeah, I think the easiest is probably on the Purdue Veterinary Medicine website. So um, I'm one of three cardiologists there. You can Google Anna McManamy and Purdue and you should find me there. 
my emails listed there as well as um, some information about our clinic and what we do. That's outstanding. Thanks for being here. Hey, uh, take care, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, everyone. And that is our episode. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. As always, uh, if you did, share the episode with your friends. Like, I, honestly, I just want to share the learning. And uh, and that's how we do it. Also, it always helps me if you write uh, an honest review wherever you get your podcast. It's how people find the show. Anyway, gang, take care of yourselves. Be well. I'll talk to you later on.